afternoon. My name is Lauren. I'm here with Harania. We are two engineers on the Firebase team at Google, and today we're excited to share with you how you can integrate Firebase into your existing infrastructure. To, so to start, I want to introduce you to Firebase in case you haven't used it already. Firebase is Google's app development platform. We make it really easy to build and ship your apps fast. We support a number of platforms like Android, iOS, web, and games, and we are built on top of Google Cloud Platform, so you get all the benefits of the global scalability of Google Cloud Platform. These are the products that Firebase offers. We offer things to help you build your apps better and faster, improve your app's quality by monitoring them, and grow your app's audience by being able to analyze, predict, and send targeted messages. There are a few products we're using today in our talk, so I'll give you a brief introduction to each of them. The first one is Firebase Authentication. This is our solution for managing users within your app. There are a number of OAuth providers we support, like Google, Facebook, GitHub, and perhaps most important for our presentation today, we also support custom authentication, where we can integrate into your existing user store. Next, we have a database solution called Cloud Firestore. This is one of the two database solutions that Firebase offers. And Cloud Firestore is a document-based database that's really great for real-time applications. So if you're building an app where you want the page to change whenever the underlying data changes, Without the user having to refresh the page, this is a great solution for you. Now you might be thinking, how do, I, how do I make sure that only certain users have access to the database and they only have access to the parts that they should be granted access into? Um, that's where security rules comes in. And that's when we tie together Firebase authentication with a database to allow fine-grained access control for your app's users. Thirdly, we have Cloud Functions for Firebase, which is our serverless solution. So you might have heard about Google Cloud Functions during this conference. This is built directly on top of Google Cloud Functions with a set of Firebase-specific tooling. And Cloud Functions allows you to respond to different events happening in your app. For example, an auth trigger allows you to listen to when a new user signed in. A Firestore trigger allows you to listen to when data has been saved. Or you can listen to an analytics conversion event to know when someone does something like complete a purchase. We support a number of other uh, event providers like PubSub, other GCP triggers, and other Firebase triggers. Now you might be thinking, that sounds great, but I'm working with legacy systems, user stores that already have existing users, and other databases that fit my, that fit my company's needs. How do I integrate those with Firebase? Or maybe I have ML models or other cloud services, admin dashboards, tools that I want to be building. So apps don't exist in isolation. Um, yours don't. Mine um, doesn't either. So how do you integrate Firebase in a seamless way with your existing infrastructure and backend systems? Firebase solves many problems for you. It's a very large and versatile platform. But as Lauren pointed out, Firebase or other mobile apps also often have external integration requirements. Firebase acknowledges this fact and strives to make it a little easier for, it, uh, for you to integrate your existing systems with Firebase. To that end, we provide a set of SDKs called admin SDKs, using which you can extend your existing systems so they can integrate and share data with the Firebase platform. Or alternatively, you can use the APIs that we provide so your systems can directly talk to Firebase or HTTPS. The basic idea here is that Firebase helps you solve many problems related to app development. But if you ever want to go beyond the boundaries of the Firebase platform and bring in your own systems and own data and APIs into the architecture, Firebase supports that too. So let's talk about these different integration options, starting with the admin SDKs. Many Firebase developers 
if you've ever written any apps with Firebase, then you should already be familiar with our client SDKs available for platforms like Android, iOS, Web, and Unity. Admin SDKs are different from them in the sense they are not designed to be integrated or they are not designed to be directly used by the end users of your app. In other words, you would never deploy an admin SDK on, on your end user's mobile device or their web browser. Instead, they are meant to be used to build core backend services and administrative tools for your apps. Because of this, you will also never deploy them, uh, you will only deploy admin SDKs in the servers that you or your organization owns and controls. Or alternatively, you can deploy them in managed cloud environments like Google Cloud Functions or App Engine, where you, as the app developer, has control over the code. Admin SDKs are available in five server-side programming languages as of today, and we will look at some of them during the upcoming demos. So speaking of demos, a lot of the, pretty much all the demos that we are going to look at today are based on a little fun little movie rating app that we built called Fireflix. I think it's very fitting since we are literally sitting in a movie theater. Mm -hmm. So let's go, to the, let's go to our demo machine and see what this looks like. Com. It's built using our JavaScript SDK and the Vue framework. If you go to this interface, you will see some example movies and some rating data. All that information is stored in Google Cloud Firestore. We also support several authentication schemes, including Google Sign-In. All of that is made possible by Firebase Auth, and this live version of the app is coming to you via Firebase Hosting. Today, you can use this interface to add some movie reviews or add them to a personal collection for easier lookup. So this looks fairly complete at this point, but we are not quite done. In fact, throughout the, course, throughout the rest of the course of this talk, we, will, we are going to implement several new use cases that will require us to integrate what we have today with a bunch of external systems. So let's go back to the slides. So what are the use cases we are going to implement? First, we want to be able to invite selected users to join the Fireflix platform and sort of become moderators of the community. We want to be able to send out some emails containing invitation codes to these selected users, and they should be able to log in to Fireflix using those invitation codes. And when they do, they should automatically gain elevated privileges in the app. Then we would want to implement some new backend services to extend the capabilities of our app, but we would also want to make sure that only specific users can actually consume these external APIs. Fireflix also supports self-sign up, so you can just go to a, a website and self-sign up using an email address and a password. For such users, we would also want to run some kind of email verification flow, so they should get a link, they can click and confirm their email. And we would want to implement that using some kind of a third-party email delivery service, something like SendGrid, for example. And finally, we want to keep track of the movie, re movie reviews posted by the users. We want to encourage users to post, but at the same time, we want to prevent them from potentially spamming the system with too, much, too many posts. So let's go through these use cases one by one and see how they are implemented, starting with uh, let's begin with our requirement for inviting selected users to be moderators. We would want to obviously pre-provision these user accounts and grant them moderator role ahead of time. And then we would want to be able to send them out some invitation codes. But first, let's talk about the idea of roles and how it's managed in a, in a platform like Firebase. In Fireflix, what we really want is the ability to differentiate between two classes of users, say, let's say regular users and moderators. Regular users can just sign up, they can read most of the data on the app, and they post movie reviews. Moderators, on the other hand, are by invitation only. They have read access to everything, can do pretty much everything a regular user can, but they also have access to certain privileged capabilities like adding new movies. Now, in order to support and enforce roles correctly in an app such as Fireflix, 
we should be able to identify the user's role both in the client code and in also in the backend services the client app depends on. One of the easiest way to do this in Firebase ecosystem is by using a technique called custom claims. It's built right into the Firebase auth flow, so let's spend a minute on figuring out how that actually works. When a Firebase app kicks off the sign-in flow, it sends the user's login credentials to Firebase auth. Firebase auth validates them, and if everything looks good, sends back an ID token refresh token pair. At this point, the app is signed in, and it can use the ID token to call any Firebase backend services, services like Firestore. The ID token is short-lived. It expires every hour, at which point the app can use the refresh token to gain a new ID token for the next hour. Now, if you build an app using one of our client SDKs, it handles this entire flow for you, so you don't have to do anything, really. It, it even takes care of automatic refreshing of the ID token periodically. Now, the ID token itself is just a JWT or a JSON web token that contains some metadata about the user encoded into it. It has a header, a body, and it is signed by Firebase Auth, so it cannot really be forged. Now, what custom claims gives us is the ability to add our own custom metadata, such as roles, into these ID. You can use the admin SDK to permanently associate some custom claims with the user account. And then whenever that user logs into our app, Firebase Auth will automatically include those custom claims in the user's ID token. And as you can see, once we get the roles encoded into the user's ID token, then we can validate those cl claims in various components of our app to implement access control. For instance, we can check for users' roles by in our own backend code using the admin SDK. There's also a way to inspect claims via Firebase security rules that enables you to implement access control in your Firestore, Firebase Storage, and Firebase Real-Time Database API calls. We will see examples of all these techniques shortly. But for now, let's go back to our original use case of implementing a user invitation flow. Our invitation flow should really take care of three things. It should create the account in Firebase Auth and grant it the moderator role by setting some custom. Then it should generate an invitation code for the new user and save it in some kind of a database or a user store. This way, when the user eventually logs in, we have a way to verify their, ID, their invitation code. And finally, it should just email out the invitation code to the user. Now, there are several different ways you can implement this. You probably have some kind of a user provisioning flow in your organization. You can bake this into that, or you can build a new administrative tool to handle this. What we did was to basically build out a little Python script using the Firebase Python admin SDK to handle this entire flow. So let's go to our demo and see how it's implemented, and then see how it actually works. So I have a little Python script called create pi, create user dot pi. And the, one of the first things I do in the script is just importing the admin SDK and some of its child modules. And then I have a function called run user invitation flow, which takes the email address of the target user and runs the invitation flow for that user. So the first thing we do is just initializing the admin SDK. If you've written any code using pretty much any Firebase SDK, then the initialize app API should, should ring some bells in your head. Once we have initialized the SDK, we can use the auth API, specific, specifically the create user API, to create a new user account in Firebase auth. This returns an object which contains the unique user ID that Firebase auth uh, has assigned to the account. And we can use that user ID and pass it to the set custom user claims API to set some custom claims on the user account. In this case, it's just one claim called moderator equals true. And then we have some code here to generate an invitation code for the user. It's just a random string that we generate. We store all this information in a collection called invites in Cloud Firestore. So we are basically using Cloud Firestore as our custom user database. You can use any database you like for this purpose. And finally, we have a send invitation email helper function, which sends out this email using a, using a SendGrid API call. So let's try this out and see if it actually works. 
So I'm going to run the script locally on my machine. And I'm going to invite Lauren to become a moderator, moderator of Fireflix. So this creates the moderator account, grants the permissions, and sends out the email. Uh, at this point, we can actually go to Firebase console and just search for user account, make sure it got created. Yep, there's the new user account just created today, minutes ago. And we, if we go to our Firestore console, we will also see a new invitation for laurenfirebase at gmail.com. Now, let's go back to the demo. The next step of this use case is actually making it possible for a user to log in using one of those invitation codes that we just emailed out. Now, remember, this is not a standard authentication mechanism. This is just something that we are inventing. So uh, since we have invited Lauren, I'm going to invite her back here to demonstrate how that part is implemented. Great. Thanks, Rania. So I've just been invited um, with the Python script. I should have gotten an email with uh, a code, an email combination. We will then, in our app, build a custom authentication service to verify that this code and email combination is valid. To do that, we will be querying our custom user store. In this case, it's actually just a Cloud Firestore database, but this could be substituted with any number of user stores that would be suitable for your application. After it verifies that code is valid, it then uses the Firebase admin SDK to generate a custom token, send that back to the client app. The client app will use it to log in to the application with Firebase authentication. So the un the, what's underpinning this flow is custom token, which is what's generated by the Firebase admin SDK. This is what it might look like. Um, you'll see that it is um, signed by a service account. And the most important information it contains is the user ID, the, or the UID for short. And this UID is what will map to the Firebase authentication user that gets created in our project once I log in. So to sign in with a custom token uh, is done through the client app. And we provide uh, a method in each of our client SDKs for them to be able to sign in to Firebase Auth with a custom token. And once the sign-in occurs, they receive an ID token in return. And this is very similar to signing in with another provider, like a Facebook or a GitHub uh, or a Gmail sign-in. So let's see how that works in action. So if you can switch to the demo, please. Um, so here I've got my uh, email open, and I see that I've just been um, invited to join as a moderator. So here I have a code, which I will copy without triggering <laughs> the definition. All right, let's now try to sign in. So I click on sign in with code with my email address and the code I just copied, click on Submit. It then asks me if I want to sync it with my Google sign-in. I don't want to do that at the moment. Um, but as you can see, I now have a new tab called Moderator that just appeared. So let's switch back to the slides, please. So let's review what just happened. I got, I got invited. I was emailed a code. I then um, was able to sign in to our custom authentication service, and I'll show you that code in a moment. And that custom authentication service then verifies that code with a custom user store. It then generates a custom token with the Firebase admin SDK, and the client app receives that and signs in to Firebase authentication. So if we can switch back to the demo screen, please. So our custom authentication service is written in Go. And uh, in this case, we've hosted on Google App Engine, but it could easily be hosted on your own server or another cloud provider. Uh, the method that's interesting to us is called Authenticate. 
and uh, it is a method that receives a couple of parameters. So we have the context of the request that was sent, the email of the user that's trying to sign in as a moderator, the code that they are using, and this method um, is a method off of an admin client. So this is a client that we've initialized with the Firebase Admin SDK in Go. We first query the user store for this email and code combination. And this user store returns that user if it exists. And if it doesn't, we get an error back and we throw that error. Uh, if it does exist, we then use the Firebase admin client that we've already initialized previously, um, with the auth service of the admin client, and we generate a custom token with the user ID. So we return this uh, custom token back to the client, and that's how the client was able to sign in and verify that I was a moderator. Uh, if we can switch back to the slides, please. So this is a great way to integrate Firebase with existing user stores that you might be using, like Active Directory or LDAP or something custom. Now that we have integrated some uses and roles with our app, the next step would be to actually go ahead and build out some, some new APIs and new services to integrate our app with, but also implement some role-based access control on top of those services. Specifically, we would want to make sure that only signed-in users, that the users who have signed into our web app can access these APIs, or only the signed-in moderators can access these APIs. Now, we already know that we can identify an authenticated user by looking at the ID token. We also know that we can inspect the custom claims in those ID tokens to figure out what roles they have. So, the easiest way to implement access control in your own backend code is by just checking, just decoding the ID token and just checking what's in there. We get the user or the client to send the ID token with every backend request. We use the admin SDK to verify the ID token or additionally check for roles. And then if the check passes, we can go ahead and perform any of the privileged operations the user wishes to perform on the server. So to demonstrate this functionality, we are going to build a new service that enables Fireflix users to tweet using the official Fireflix Twitter handle. But we want to make sure that only authenticated moderators are able to access this endpoint. We allow moderators to create new movies in our database, so hopefully they can use this feature to tweet about new additions. So the way this is going to be implemented is we are going to put our backend logic for actually tweeting using the Twitter API in a backend server. The, the user will call out to this endpoint using the tweet that needs to be published along with the ID token, and then we will verify it, and if everything looks good, we'll call the Twitter API on behalf of the user. We implement this service in Go. In fact, uh, it's going to be a simple addition to the same Go application that Lauren demonstrated earlier. So it's running in Google App Engine. A moderator can call it from the app and, uh, and get the Twitter, uh, Twitter API invoked through that. So let's go to our demo machine again and see what that code looks like. The function that gets triggered in this flow is called check auth. It receives the ID token of the caller as an argument. If you don't get an ID token, that means if a request comes in without a valid ID token, we return an error immediately. If not, we go ahead and call the verify ID token API of the admin SDK. It performs a series of checks, and if everything looks good, it actually gives us a decoded representation of the ID token, and we can query that decoded representation to check if it actually has the moderator claim in it. If not, again, we return an error. Now, we wired up our web web application in a way so that all incoming requests first hit this function. And if it returns an error, it user gets a HTTP 401 unauthorized error. Otherwise, this code will actually go and call the Twitter API. So let's see how this code actually works by first sending a couple of uh, fake requests. So this is the end in App Engine that we are going to call. First, I'm going to call this without any ID token header at all. Just trying to send a, uh, um, I'm basically sending this hello world post request. So as we would expect, we get ID token not specified error. 
which is the error message that we return when there's no ID token available. Alternatively, we can try to send a uh, bogus ID token header. So if Firebase ID token is the custom header that our web is programmed to look for. So this is just a fake JWT. Uh, it just looks like an ID token, but it's really not. So it fails to verify the token signature, as you would expect. So to get this check to pass, we had to actually call it as a moderator through our So I'm going to use this new tweet function. Tweet something. It says tweet, tweet posted. So hopefully we can see it on the Twitter uh, right now. There we go. So let's go back to our slides. Now, we've been telling you you can use the admin SDK to verify ID tokens, but we haven't really told you what happens under the hood. The check performed by the admin SDK is actually quite strong. It checks for a number of things, like it has the correct signature, which is by far the most important thing. But it also checks that the token is not expired. Remember, so that has to be checked. Uh, and also things like the token was indeed issued against your Firebase project, not coming from some random other Firebase project. Uh, and also, this is a fairly fast operation. It does not make any RPC calls, so it is OK to do this check for every incoming request. Now, one thing this API doesn't check for is whether the ID token is revoked or not. Our admin SDKs actually have a revoke refresh token set. will and send actions issued to users up to that point. It's a way and to log back in. Now, if you want to check if the ID token has been revoked since it was issued, there's a separate API for that. In Go, it's called Verify ID Token and Check Revoked. But this actually does make an API call, so you, uh, or an RPC call. So you do have to take that overhead into account. The other way you can enforce roles and authorization in Firebase apps is by using Firebase security rules. Security rules are a policy-driven approach to intercept API calls made by your clients to services like Firestore, Cloud Storage, and Real-Time Database, and make sure that they, they adhere to certain policies that you've defined. For example, we have this file security rule in place, which is what restricts uh, the ability to create new moves. Uh, only to moderators. So this rule applies to our movies collection, which is a collection that we actually have in our Firestore database. That's where all the movies are. As you can see, we, we give the right permission to only use who contains the moderator claim in their auth token. This regulates us from being able to create or update movie meta. Moving on to our next use case, which is to uh, be able to run an email verification flow for our self-sign-up users. We need to, be, to basically send the user some kind of a verification link, which they click and confirm their email address. Now, interestingly, this is actually something you can do just in the client side using our client SDKs. Our client SDKs ha provide a send email verification API. When you call it, it email verification flow for you. However, the email sent out by this API, they use a pre-configured set of email templates, and they also use a built-in email delivery service. But if you're a large enterprise, you probably would want to customize the content and layout of these emails by including the company logo and other branding information in the emails that go out. Or you may have your own email infrastructure for the kind of things which you want to use. So if you want that kind of flexibility, then you should consider implementing this flow using uh, as another backend integration. So how are we going to do it? We are going to use Cloud Functions for Firebase. We are going to implement a plus function every time a new user signs up to Firebase. And inside this function, we will use the Node.js SDK to generate an email verification link put it into a template of our choosing, and send out using a third-party email delivery service, SendGrid uh, in this case. 
So let's go to our demo machine and l let's look at what this cloud function looks like. Whoa. <laughs> Thank you. So we have a cloud function called send email verification. As you can see, this is implemented using the Firebase Functions SDK, which is a set of extensions that, uh, that are developed on top of Google Cloud Functions. So we have an onCreate trigger type, which gets triggered every time a new user signs up uh, for our project. This receives a user record object that describes the newly signed up user. The first thing we do is check whether this is actually a password uh, or a self sign up user with a password. Because you see, we have several different ways users can sign up to our app through Google sign in, or it could be a user that we manually create using our Python script. So we have to first filter those out. So we have a little check for that here. But if it's a password user, then we go ahead and call the admin SDK, uh, the specifically the generate email verification link API, which gives us a, a, a URL link. Then we have this send email help function, which puts it into our own template and send out, sends it out using, uh, using SendGrid. So I'm going to go ahead and create a new account on our website. I'm going to just log out the existing session and go ahead and click on sign up. Uh, I'm just going to use the same email address, but with a uh, suffix. And just add a password there. Submit, and that will actually create the account and log me in. But as you can see, the system recognizes that it's an unverified user account. Now, if we now that event alone should have triggered our cloud function, so we can go to the cloud functions console or the uh, logs uh, in our project. Hopefully, we'll see the new event here, 147. That's about a few seconds ago. So the link is already en route. We can probably, oh, here we go. So we now have a verify email link sent out by our cloud function. We can use this link to actually verify our user account. Okay. That's going to. The system recognized me as a verified user account because I've clicked on the link. Let's go back to the slides. So in addition to generating email verification links, our admin SDKs also have APIs for generating password reset links and links for email sign-in. You can use these APIs to further flesh out your user management landscape uh, uh, and, and truly integrate your existing systems more deeply with Firebase and Firebase Auth. Now, what we just saw was just one application of Cloud Functions, and I'm going to invite Lauren back to show other cool stuff you can do with uh, Cloud Functions. Awesome. Thanks, Karania. Uh, so sometimes we might want to respond to critical events happening in our application, and Cloud Functions is a great way of doing that. So the particular event we want to respond to is when a user is posting too many reviews too quickly. Um, so in other words, they're spamming the system, and we want a way to ban them. And you can do that with the Firebase Admin SDK, integrated inside of a cloud function. You can prevent future logins and revoke any existing refresh tokens. Now, you, if you've been paying attention, you might remember an ID token lasts for an hour. So sometimes this could actually take up to an hour. What if we want to ban our user right away? And that's where security rules um, comes in. So you might remember earlier uh, I talked about how Firebase uh, uses security rules to, um, to allow granular access control of database. And we do this based on the user ID of a user within Firebase authentication. Um, so here we've got an example of a security rule that you can write. So we have a function here called is blacklisted that checks to see if that user ID is found in the blacklist collection in Firestore. 
And we then do a match rule for the collection where ratings are stored to see if the user is in the blacklist. If the user is in the blacklist, then they're not allowed to write a, write, a, a rating. We then also lock down control to the blacklist to make sure nobody can write to it. Only a privileged environment like a cloud function can make changes to the blacklist. So let's see how all of that works. So here we've got our cloud functions code. And I'm going to just scroll down to our function called update activity indicators, which is where all of this happens. So this is a Firestore triggered function. It is triggered on rise to any ratings. So in other words, when someone has posted a new rating. We first get the user ID, and this we get from the parameter within the database path. We then have a helper function that checks this user ID to see if they've been posting a lot of reviews in the last um, little bit and see if we should ban them. So in our demo today, we are allowing two messages for every two minutes. And if users are posting more than that, then they will be banned. If should ban is true, we will then update the user's um, user object in Firebase authentication to be disabled. We will also add them to the blacklist collection in Firestore. Remember, this is the collection we're checking for in our security rules to see if the user is able to do another rating. And if we don't end up needing to ban the user, we will reward them for their review by incrementing their score. So let's try to see if I can trigger the blacklist. So here we've got some movies, and I'm going to just start writing some reviews. Um, so I'm going to write a review for this one. Um, uh, a tattooed Interpol agent sounds like a bad movie. Uh, sorry if you actually like this movie, but I'm going to rate it one star. All right, let's see. We've got this one. Oh, it's a cop movie. I typically like cop movies, so we'll rate that a four star out of five. So I've now hit my max. So the next one I rate should trigger the blacklist. Um, so let's do a review. So I get, an, oh, I get this review submitted. Let's try to do one more. So I now uh, I am banned from submitting any more reviews, as you can see from this error message. Now that was from the security, security rules that we just looked at. Let's see if I can log out and log back in. If I try to log in again, I see that my account has been disabled by the administrator. Can we switch back to the slides, please? So one thing I do want to note is you should not be deleting user accounts as a way to ban them. And the reason for that is then they can just sign up again and create a new account. Whereas if you actually disable the account, then that prevents them from doing further activity. Up until now, we've been using the admin SDK to do all our external integrations. But there might be times where you would want to implement an integration without an admin SDK. Maybe your use case is very simple, and you feel like taking a dependency on the SDK is overkill. Or maybe you're programming in a language for which the admin SDK is not available yet. Whatever your reasons are, Firebase strives to expose its services via REST whenever possible, so you can access them over good old HTTPS. So as our last demo, let's look at how to implement a simple CLI tool that interacts with the Firebase real-time database over REST. Our objective is to build a Ruby client for displaying the top 10 most active Fireflex users. We don't have an official admin SDK for Ruby yet, so this gives us an excuse to use REST. Uh, as for tracking the most active users, remember that we already have a workflow implemented in Cloud Functions that Lauren demonstrated earlier, which awards users points for their posts. So the data we are looking for is already stored in real-time database. So now we are just go going to implement the, the lower part of this diagram, where our CLI tool securely queries for the most active users. 
And if you're wondering why we are using real-time database for this last demo, it's because the REST API for real-time database actually supports richer queries at the moment than Firestore does. So all Firebase and GCP REST APIs uh, support OAuth2. So we need to include an OAuth2 bear token in all the requests we make. The easiest way to do this is by using one of the official Google Auth libraries, which are available in about seven different programming languages. That's what we are going to do. But if you feel that's too heavyweight, you can also code the Auth flow yourself, just a standard Auth flow. In general, if you have a Google Space account or a refresh token, you can always exchange that for a valid uh, Auth2 token. So let's go to our demo again. Look at what our Ruby code. It's been a while since I've written any Ruby code. So the first thing we do is just require the Google Auth Ruby gem. And then we have some code here to just initialize it out using a Google application default credentials. And this is the URL that we are going to make the REST call on. It's basically just a direct URL to the real-time database. Uh, and we are requesting for the uh, requesting it to order all the data by the all the users by their score and give me the uh, 10 last or the 10 highest uh, scores in the database. And then we basically have a big loop here which periodically makes the same REST API call, some code here to actually apply uh, the authorization header to the outgoing request, and some code to parse the JSON response coming from real-time database and show it in a nice little uh, uh, CLI view. So let's quickly try it out. So here are some fake data that's coming from uh, from our database. We didn't want to put you. A, we didn't want to make sure. We want to make sure that your email doesn't accidentally appear here. Very famous people there, and Sam Stern for some reason, who's a DevRel for Firebase. Uh, just to make sure that it's working as intended. I'm going to go and just update some data manually and see if it gets picked up. Real-time database. Uh, right now, Steven Spielberg has 2,000 points. I'm going to boost his point by a factor of 10. And yeah, so you can see it gets jumps up to the top right away. Let's go back to our demo slides. So real-time database is certainly not the only Firebase product for which there's a REST API. In fact, we are increasingly opening up our products for RESTful integrations. This is just a partial list of what's available today. And the nice thing is the way you authorize requests for all these APIs is identical to what we demonstrated today. So if you know how to integrate with one REST API, you can pretty much use any of these other REST APIs as well. Now we are approaching the end of our talk. We've been looking at a lot of, t lot of code and a lot of demos in the last 50 minutes or so. So it's a good time to take a step back and just take the bird's eye view of everything we've developed so far. We started out with a fairly straightforward Firebase app that uses Firebase Auth and Cloud Firestore as our database. Then we implemented a little Python script to create new user accounts in Firebase Auth and grant them the moderator role by setting some custom claims. The same script also handles generating invitation codes and saving them into a database. Then we implemented a little Go App Engine endpoint that allows users to log into Fireflex using the invitation codes they receive over email. We added a second endpoint to that same Go application, which receives the ID token of the caller, verifies it, and if it's coming from a moderator, calls out to another uh, external API, Twitter in this case, to publish some tweets, tweets. Then we implemented a custom email verification flow using cloud functions for Firebase. We implemented a serverless function that gets triggered every time a new user signs up. There we use the Node.js admin SDK to generate email verification links and send them out. Then we looked at a second cloud function that gets triggered for every movie review posted by a user. We use it to uh, track uh, spammer, uh, spamming behavior and potentially ban, the, ban such users from the system. We disable their user accounts in Firebase Auth and use Firebase security rules to cut off their immediate access to, to our database. And finally, we implemented a little Ruby CLI tool to securely query our real-time database over REST. Now, this is certainly a lot of moving parts implemented in several different 
about four different languages. Your application architecture is probably not as complex or distributed, at least maybe not yet. But the point we are trying to make is that if you want to build something more advanced and sophisticated using Firebase, you certainly can. You can start simple like we did with just one or two Firebase services and then incrementally bring your existing systems, APIs, and data into the architecture and try to stay ahead of your changing requirements. You can use things like the admin SDK, REST APIs, and cloud functions to bridge different components and make sure that you use the same users, roles, and data both in Firebase and everywhere else. Laura? So in conclusion, Firebase is a development platform that allows you to build your apps, monitor their performance, and grow your user base. And we can integrate with your existing systems, whether they are on-prem or with another cloud provider. And there's two main ways you do that. One is by using the Firebase admin SDK. Uh, we used that SDK in several languages today. And you can also use the REST APIs, which you can call within your server um, or any server. And lastly, we also demonstrated how you can use Cloud Functions as a glue between different services and also as a way to respond to critical events happening in your app. All of our SDKs, including the Firebase admin SDKs, are open source. So we invite you to be part of our community, to file bug reports, contribute, and give us your feature requests.